Grace, mercy, and peace be yours in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Tonight's message is based off of our gospel lesson. I read again Mark 14, 22 through 24. As they were eating, he took bread, and after blessing it, broke it, and gave it to them, and said, Take, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Here ends the reading of our text. May God add his blessings to the reading of his word. Amen. Who doesn't like a special meal? I expect it is a universal human tradition. Special food, special people, special memories, all make them high points in the year. We have Thanksgiving meals, Easter meals, Super Bowl parties, birthday parties, and more. God is well aware that he has made us this way. That is why he also has a special meal. But it is grander than any of our purely human meals. God's meal changed history. We find Jesus engaging in this meal in our gospel lesson. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he gathered his disciples together in an upper room to celebrate the Passover meal. The first Passover was celebrated by the Israelites centuries before, when the Lord delivered them from Egyptian slavery. At that time, the firstborn of everything in the land of Egypt was killed. Those homes that believed the warning given by God painted the frames of their doors with the blood of a lamb which was sacrificed and then became the main course of the first Passover. The angel of death passed over those homes. They were basically where the Hebrews lived because the non-Hebrews were tr trusting in idols and therefore didn't heed God's warning. This meal was to be observed each year. In Exodus 13, God speaks of the future Passover meals after the Israelites had entered into the Promised Land, after the generation that had escaped Egypt had died. He said, And when in time to come your son asks you, What does this mean? You shall say to him, By a strong hand the Lord brought us out of Egypt from the house of slavery. Notice that the response the father is to give his son is that God brought us out of Egypt, not God brought our ancestors out of Egypt. The observant Jew knows the Exodus is part of their own personal history. The meal is a participation in the first Passover meal and is their own meal of freedom from bondage. This is the meal Jesus was sharing with his disciples. Jesus takes this meal that transcends time and gives it more. Because the Lord's Supper is built on the Passover, communion continues to connect the participants to the great deliverance the Lord provided in the first Passover. However, it also is a participation in the greater Passover that happened the first Holy Week. This is the connection we emphasize most, recognizing the first Passover meal as a type pointing to the Lord's Supper and the Lord's death. If we attend to the words of institution Jesus spoke, we notice the same real-time participation in the salvation event that the Jews did in the first century with the saving event of the first Passover. Jesus said, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Jesus didn't say which will be poured out, but which is. The meal connects us to the death of Jesus. We notice the same timeless words used when St. Paul writes of the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians 11. This is my body, which is broken for you. Paul does not say was broken, but is broken. The Lord's Supper is not just a memorial meal, but a participation in the cross of Christ. It is that participation that brings forgiveness to those who believe. For where the blood of Christ is received in faith, there is forgiveness in life. There is a third aspect to this meal, out of time, that Jesus established, and that is the heavenly banquet. We get a peek at this meal in our reading from Exodus 24, 
where the seventy elders ate in the presence of God but did not die. This heavenly banquet is found throughout the Bible. So, for example, <clears throat> Isaiah reports God as saying, On this mountain the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, a rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. Here God connects the Lord's Supper with the heavenly feast and the event that swallowed up death forever, that is, the sacrifice of Jesus. In Revelation we read, And the angel said to me, Write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Here the marriage feast is in heaven. However, those who are invited are those who joined the feast before Christ returns to judge the living and the dead. In this way, the passage in Revelation echoes the parable Jesus told in Matthew 25 about the ten virgins. As you recall, five were wise and five were foolish. The foolish virgins ran out of oil, that is faith, and were not ready for the return of their master. The five wise virgins held on to their faith and were ready for their master's return. Jesus said, And while the foolish virgins were going to buy some oil, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Once again, heaven is depicted as a feast. It is a feast that all who trust in Christ will join. It is the feast the elders of Israel had a foretaste of on Mount Sinai. Their feast was a foretaste of the Lord's Supper, which is a foretaste of the heavenly banquet. It is the feast all of the redeemed participate in in glory. Now, the title of, the, of this sermon is The Meal That Changed History. At first glance, one might say that the Lord's Supper changed the church, changed how the people of God worshipped, but not necessarily history. But if we remember that this meal connects us to the great saving events of time past and future, and that these events are, in reality, the turning points of human history, then it isn't really too bold a claim to make about communion. It is the meal that changed history. It connects us to the history-changing salvation of Israel when they escaped Egypt. It connects us to the history-changing death of Jesus on the cross. And it connects us to the history-changing second coming of our Lord. In every case, God comes to rescue his people. In this sacred meal, this mystery, this sacrament, Christ comes to rescue his people still. I don't say once again, I say still, for this is a timeless meal. It is always a participation in the ever-present salvation of our Lord. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.